I'd like to welcome you to the Wheeler Centre's Talking Point. Um, my name is Narelle Hooper. I'm the editor of a magazine called Boss that appears in the Australian Financial Review and I'm the chair tonight. And um, I'm going to have to compete with three fantastic guests. We're going to introduce them in, in a moment. Um, tonight, there's a, um, a topic that's been very, it's been very interesting in the last um, couple of years to see the issue of agenda coming back on the, the public agenda. And tonight, the topic is banging on the ceiling. Now, not this very nice ceiling, but perhaps something that's transparent. You can see what's going on above, but can't participate. And just a little bit of way of framing it up. When the women of Australia started their march towards equal rights, and that was almost half a century ago, but we know this has been going on a lot longer, it was envisaged of broad ranging changes. But even today, when we still, we make up about half the workforce, not quite, um, but very close. But those areas of male privilege remain, and none more so than our uh, company boardrooms and the, t the management suites in this country where commerce is generated and economic wealth and um, influence is weighed. So they account for less than one in ten of private company directorships actually, um, that's private, that's right, uh, listed company directorships that's crept up over 11% now, wow. Um, but that was a lot higher a few years ago and it started to go backwards and we might talk about that in a minute. Um, and while women earn 16% less than men in overall terms in the financial sector, they earn about a third less. Um, so we're going to examine some of these issues tonight, but what I'd like to do is just see if we can find a way through, because it's been a, a bit like blancmange in so many ways. Now, to discuss the questions, um, I'm going to intro introduce our guest. Um, to my left is Dr. Helen, Helen Zoki. She's the Commissioner and Chair of the Board of the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission, and she was appointed to the position by the Attorney General back in 2009. Now, Helen was formerly the Chief Executive and Chief Conciliator at the Commission, and you were in that position from two, December 2004 until you were appointed as Commissioner. Um, you've been involved in management and in community, and we're going to draw on some of your perspectives tonight. Now, in the middle is someone I know very well who's been, um, certainly in the business community, very active on, on the issue, Carol Schwartz. Carol's a visionary leader. She's someone who has absolute courage and an ability to speak her mind. She uh, is chair of Qualitas Partners and she has the Trawalla Foundation as well. She's very active in community philanthropy and she's on the board of Stockland, one of our biggest property companies as well. Now she's also um, had impacts in other aspects of society through um, very diverse portfolio appointments and you're involved, the, um, and you might tell us a little more about that tonight, the Women's Leadership Institute Australia, which is your latest venture as well. And over opposite me is Professor Margaret Alston and Margaret is Professor of Social Work and the Head of the Department of Monash University. She was appointed as an honorary professor at Sydney University in 2005 and at Charles Sturt University in 2009. And at Monash she's established the, I really lo like this, this is partly why we've got this topic tonight isn't it Margaret, the GLASS research unit and that stands for Gender Leadership and Social Sustainability and I love the way that we link those issues together because Goodness knows we need all of that, but anyway. Um, now previously she was Charles Sturt University for 21 years. You were just down the road, well, 36 kilometres or so from me because I grew up around there some years ago. <laughs> yeah, um, this is in um, Bathurst, New, New South Wales. Now most recently she's, she was a Professor of Social Work and in 2010 Margaret was awarded one of Australia's highest honours and that was the Medal of the Order of Australia for services to the community, social work and to rural women. And you've also been engaged as a UN gender expert by that division at the UN's Food and Agricultural Organisation, um, studying gender and climate change back in 2008 to 10. Would you please put your hands together and welcome our three guests. Thank you. Now our um, discussion this evening is going to extend beyond the room to the web and um, it's part of the, the the outreach, if you like, of the Wheeler Centre in the community. So uh, in, a, in a while, I'm going to be looking for questions and I'm, I'm sure you've got some and uh, we'll welcome a, a really interactive discussion. 
But first, I just I wanted to read to you something um, that had been given to me from uh, Helen Nugent is on the board of Macquarie Bank. She's a highly respected uh, director in in business. She's involved in the arts community. And some, a couple of years ago, she was cleaning out the papers um, after her father died in his office, and he was an academic. And she found a 1940s leadership training manual. So this is what they were teaching back in the 1940s. And she, she just gave me a few lines from this, and I just wanted to share those with you. Women, because they are women, have always created out of the ordinary problems for managers. The motives of why women work are a factor, and many more women than will frankly admit go to work in the hope of meeting a marriageable man. <laughs> it then goes on to outline the eight reasons why women may work. To provide finance to prepare for marriage, because their husbands can't or won't work, for occupation of mind, to help support their parents, and I like this one, because they have an intense dislike of housework. <laughs> oh, and finally, at the end, to create a career for themselves. Now, it then goes on to say this creates an in interesting insight into the attitudes of, of, um, of how to deal with women in the workplace. So we've been brainwashed by some of this thinking. But can I just share this last bit with you? Um, the basic factors that make women behave differently from men are contained in the biological functioning of their internal, internal organs and bodily functions. Bodily working, sorry. Some generally accepted emotional differences between men and women are as follows. Women's involuntary nervous system is not as stable as a man's. The greater sensitivity of their delicate organ nervous organisation is reflected in the influence of different weather conditions. <laughs> I'm serious. Fatigue, headaches, lassitude, moods. Women experience pretty well-marked stress periods in which they are not themselves. And the periods are menstruation, the age of 30, <laughs> I'm, I'm particularly angry at that. I, I haven't been myself <laughs> all year. <laughs> Anxiety, sudden fear and grief are just a few of these stress times. Now, I laughed, but I also boiled with anger at that, at being so misunderstood as a human being. But that was to set the scene because um, from, now this is my perspective, I feel we've had so many centuries of socialisation of the way men and women, um, what's expected, the way they work, the way they come together, that is it any surprise that we're still struggling with this? Um, and I hope I'm not here in another decade to talk about this issue about why we're not seeing more women in, um, reflected in positions of power and influence in society. But let's um, start with our guest, okay? Um, so, Helen Zoki, can I start with you? Um, you recently said in an article that part of the women's career frustrations has been because, quote, men just don't get it. So what do you mean by that? Well, at the time that um, this was commenting around International Women's Day, and I guess a lot of the work that we do at the Commission is looking at um, women who've had very bad experiences, so we, we deal with discrimination. And the, the men just don't get it line, I suppose, is really about the fact that um, women have a contribution. Women often do do things differently, uh, and that's uh, sometimes very challenging, I guess, to the male paradigm, uh, that women um, have a contribution to make uh, that just still isn't recognised. And I suppose one of the uh, disturbing things is, I mean, we look at the, the women from, you know, the household through to the boardroom and what their experiences are. And it really is astonishing that up until the global financial crisis in Australia, we had probably the decade of unprecedented prosperity like we never had before. And that was the decade in which all of the indicators in relation to women's participation went back. All of the kind of, um, I guess, the, the status or the grounds that women had won over many, many years of hard work um, numerical or qualitative indicators had gone backwards and the people who were left 
making critical decisions about um, promotion opportunities in all sorts of workplaces, about boardroom appointments, about um, senior management appointments, about uh, women joining male occupations like um, police and fire brigade and emergency services and defence forces, dare I say, with what's happened uh, this year. Uh, they are men and so I guess there's a point at which you just really do think, well men don't get it and so that, that begs the question then of how do we encourage men to get it with all due respect to the men in the room mm. uh, and the men generally in the community who, who do. But, um, you, you know, it's no, it's no um, surprise or it's no, um, it, it, you know, it, it leaves the question asked. The decision makers, the key decision makers in many aspects of life are predominantly male. So one has to ask, well, what's, what's going wrong there? Mm. And it isn't uh, and we will, I'm sure we'll explore some examples mm -hmm. later. It's not because there isn't a capacity uh, for women to contribute. It's not because there's a willingness. Uh, there are some structural barriers, but even there, there's a whole pool of talent that's just being underutilised in all areas of life in, in Australia. All right. Can I just back up and, and say briefly, why do you think it went backwards during a, a decade when we were doing economically better than ever before? Well... I, I don't understand it yeah. because what we see um, across all sorts of occupations and professions, and I you know, make a point of saying occupations as well, we know that in the context of education that our education rates for women are, uh, we're about fourth on the OECD country. So we have a really high participation rate of women in education. Across most professions and occupations, we see a dropout of women around the middle management level. So childbearing years are part of it, so there are structural issues there. I think that the, I think as, as we as a country are very, very conservative about how we construct work and how we construct our workplaces. We're really locked into a very traditional notion of work and, uh, and we don't necessarily have um, the other things that perhaps countries like Sweden and so on have that uh, facilitate participation in public life even, not just in work life but more broadly in public life. Mm. Um, so we do know that at that middle management level, whether you're talking about Victoria Police or, or uh, the public service or private companies, there's a wastage of women who are highly educated, who've got fantastic qualifications, who've started to build up experience and we lose them. And I don't think we lose them just because they decide to have a baby. We lose them because uh, they're discriminated against on the basis of pregnancy. We lose them because we don't make workplaces accessible. Uh, we lose them because there's no recognition of if you if you have a period of time out of work, how you re-enter. Um, and uh, we've really got a long way to go to be much more creative and lateral about utilising a resource we have in the community. Okay. Uh, can I just say, I think yes. that Helen's absolutely right. And I, think I was that, going to ask you that. Yeah, I think that... Um, <laughs> In fact, um, it was that that ten years of prosperity was actually very insidious. I think, in terms of creating, um, for want of a better expression, social engineering, which actually moved women out of the workforce and 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 into the home. And the the expectation was that women not participate fully and not participate at senior levels and 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 it becomes part of the system and that's reflected in the tax system it's reflected in benefits it's reflected in um, child care and what child care is available to women and what support for child care there is um, and the way of course as, as Helen's just pointed out organizations are in fact um, organised, how they, you know, they, they just do not cater for people who uh, come in and go out. Mm -hmm. Can I make yes, a point Margaret, too? Yes. During that period, we lost a lot of the women's instrumentality. So the Office of Women was wound back. Um, we lost uh -huh. a lot of the women's departments that were focusing on assisting women to get um, supports and policy. Um, it's not the only reason. We went to a system of gender mainstreaming, but we didn't implement that appropriately. 
Um, the other point I'd like to make while I've got the floor, re uh, hearing your quote, which we hadn't heard before, was really quite instructive because what we're seeing there is the invisible normative is male and female is actually abnormal in relation to male. And I think when you, when you put women as the other and you don't support them with childcare, with, with um, assistance to help them with their lives, to, to have a working life and to have um, a balanced life, then of course you have women um, departing from the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, can I just share a story with you too while I have got the, the microphone? About three weeks ago I was in Bangladesh where we're doing some research down in the Bay of Bengal. Now these were with the poorest of the poor women in the world. In Bangladesh they have quotas um, and 30% of positions in decision making bodies have to be women. Now they can do that there in the Bay of Bengal and we can't do it here in Australia. I think there's something really wrong. Mm. We're going to come back to quotas because there's an issue here of how we deal with this. Um, I think you've... Um, and could I welcome the men who've come tonight? Um, because without men who actually... Um, and, and warmly engage in these issues, we, we don't get a long way, as we know. <laughs> so your treasures, all of you. Everybody is actually here tonight in the rain. But um, Margaret's raised a really good point, which, and, and it, I think it comes to the, the men don't get it. Often, is it that we don't see the the rules, you know, the, the framework, the, what you call the norms, that, that there is a way of operating that's been established over many decades or centuries? And then if you're the dominant power group, you don't actually see how that comes to be a, an invisible advantage in a sense. Well, but if you're outside and you, you can't crack that, that... I think that the marker of privilege in our society is workplace participation. And I think that's where we've, we've come unstuck because we don't reward caring. We don't superannuate caring. And yet it is women who do the bulk of the caring. We're finding that women are getting to um, retirement age and can't retire because they don't have superannuation built up. So we really need to start thinking outside the square and valuing or privileging something other than workplace participation or as well as workplace. I'm not saying that women shouldn't be in the workplace, but the fact that we're now seeing a whole lot of women not able to retire who don't have superannuation mm. means that we have a problem and uh, I think we need to address those sorts of issues. Yeah. I guess so the... Um, I, I mean, I'm also interested in the fact that for many of us in, in the community, work defines a lot of our life. You know, it defines our contribution. And when we... Um, We've, we've looked at some of the work that's been done in areas which is uh, around blind recruitment. Um, so this, this has a particular impact for people who are from particular racial backgrounds. But you do wonder when, and Carol, you'll be able to comment on this with your own direct experience, but when you have a boardroom recruiting new directors or, a, a, you know, uh, the, the reality is that people tend to gravitate towards people who are like them. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's the kind of thing that you were talking about. So a uh, part of what happens is that there, there isn't a fresh look at what other people can bring, you mm -hmm. know, whether it's a woman or whether it's someone with a disability or whether it's someone from a different cultural background. And a lot of the research that's done around blind recruitment actually gets people to the start line, in fact. And I think some of the involvements that you've had, Carol, have actually looked at what it takes to get women at least so that they, they can start the race mm. and then win it on their own merits. And, well, uh, you know, there are a lot of barriers to that, I think. Can you just explain what you mean by blind recruitment? Well, in the case of the blind recruitment process, basically what you get is an application form which doesn't tell you anything about the personal attributes of mm. the applicant. So it gives you their career history. Uh, what they've succeeded, what they've you know achieved in in their life, what their qualifications are, but it doesn't say whether they're um, a Muslim or whether they're an Aboriginal or in this case it might be used about whether they're a man or a woman. Um, so. And one of the things we hear constantly when we hear complaints of discrimination uh, about selection process, people say, "Oh no, you know we're a merit-based selection process," and that's 
true to some extent, but there are all sorts of lenses that people bring to their decision making. And in, the, in relation to gender equity, um, I get back to my original point, and I'm not being anti-male, but the reality is, the practical reality is, the majority of significant decisions in the workplace or in other settings are made by men who bring a gender lens to their own decision making. There's that very famous example of the um, symphony conductor who said that he would not employ women violinists because they don't play as well as men. And uh, then what they did was they had people um, being interviewed from behind a screen where he couldn't see where, who was being auditioned, whether, oh. whether they were male or female, and he kept choosing the women. <laughs> yeah. and that's, and a, that's, that's a that's blind a interview. That's an absolutely yeah. wonderful yeah. example. That actually wound up becoming the... The, the way of select, uh, selection, I think. That's from right. It, it, and, uh, was that the New York Philharmonic or I can't something? Remember and, which one anyway, it the was, policy is spread. And then yeah. I did hear, I think it may be apocryphal, but I did hear that um, someone went up to the conductor who introduced that and said, So you're the one that <laughs> let the women in. <laughs> but anyway, that's, that's another. But what Helen says is absolutely mm. right. I mean, I see it all the time. And, and you know, one of the. Um, one of the layers in the process that is really to blame for this is, is actually the recruitment people. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating that the recruiters don't see it as their role to actually be creative and, and educate the people that they're working with in the recruitment process. So they will allow a chairman or a CEO to say, well, um, I need to recruit a CFO who's had public company experience. So the recruiter says, well, which of the five women who are CFOs from public companies would you like to see? Rather than saying, well, actually, why don't you interview this person because she's actually fantastic and she can do the role and this is the way um, you can create uh, support for her because she actually doesn't need to have necessarily public company experience to do an absolutely brilliant job in your organisation. And it's a real issue. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, as Helen says, you know, there's, there are certain paradigms and models within which people work, and, and you see it happening every day. Mm -hmm. We, we yeah. are starting to hear more about unconscious biases, which goes, I think, to your yeah. point that it, it, it's something we don't see. So to I think flush the other that thing out a little is, bit more. I mean, I've, I've had the experience where, you know, when I've done presentations to organisations and the... Um, the chair will say to me, well, you know, look at our boardroom, you know, the, the, it's all men, what do we do about that? And, and I think it's, it's a similar to, again, what Carol's saying. If you actually want to, um, if, if you understand that there is a benefit in having um, good representation of women, equal representation of women, majority representation of women in your business, you have to make that a project. You have to say, this is what we're going to achieve. Just like we say, we're aspiring to have our profit at this percentage rate this year, or we're, we're aspiring to do this number of acquisitions, or you know whatever our value statement is. Um, and I think that's one of the, the lessons out of the you know the kind of period of the all of those indicators going backward for women. Um, and we need that to be men and women who are kind of making that a project and making that a decision about whatever their organisation or their business is. Can, it leads us I, a little bit back to yeah. the quota stuff. But can, can I just interject and say that there's also a lot of room for gender training for boardrooms. Um, we did a study with 300 women who were on boards in um, public companies and statutory bodies and they were confronted with comments like, well, we need a token woman, you're it, or would you mind making the tea today? You know, th there are a whole lot of um, language problems associated with the way that um, women are dealt with on boards, but also elsewhere. Yeah, I learned very quickly not to wear a black suit and a white shirt to meetings. Otherwise, I'd be asked to make the coffee. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and I think language is really powerful. And, and we have um, words like, or phrases like working mothers, but we don't necessarily hear about working fathers. So again, it's about um, language is a very powerful tool to, to make women um, subordinate. And it was interesting and instructive to see in the budget discussions that young mothers, single mothers, again, are in the firing line. The poorest and the most vulnerable are in the firing line yet again. Um, so
so I think language and the way we shape and, and frame our, our discussions of women are very important to this. It's also an issue of role modelling. I mean, the fact is that when we have no women in leadership and senior roles, you don't have the role models for other women to aspire to. And you, you, you also don't have the example of women making key decisions in, in our corporations, in our governments, in, in, in academia. It's, and, and the fact that you don't have that critical mass in the leadership roles has consequences all down the line. You, you come to a number of, of myths, which you, and, and one of those being, and, and I heard it from a very senior company chairman, which is, well, we had a woman once. <laughs> I tried that mm. um, and it didn't work. And so I'm just going to drop a couple more pieces of information into this discussion. And one of those is that every piece of research on change management shows that you need to get a, um, a broad kind of momentum. And it's about 30 to 40 percent and of whatever you're trying to achieve. So once you get to that, things start to kind of evolve very quickly. Now the other point is that there's been, a, and I'm sure you, you'll be able to tell me this as well, the, there's a body of research now that shows that companies who have uh, more, uh, kind of roughly equal numbers of men and women in their senior management levels and on their boards perform better financially than those who either have all men or mostly men or, or women and mostly women. So well, why that... do you think why do you think it is that shareholders therefore are not demanding that there be more diversity in senior roles and on boards in, in organisations if in fact mm -hmm. there is a higher return for shareholders if that is in fact the, the case? That's that's my question in a way, because that does something about that tell you that this is not a, if it were logical and rational, then it, it would be so. But it's not. So uh, underneath that, then, what is required to actually get the shareholders to, to start to find Well, it's interesting because as an you, you issue. interview yeah. a lot of yeah. chairmen and, and corporate directors. Why, why do you think that is? Why do you think that there isn't more shareholder activism around the gender issue? When, you, when the, the, the numbers show, mm -hmm. the research show, there's a greater return on, on equity and a greater return to shareholders. I think... For a long time it wasn't um, actually, I, I, I don't think the research bubbled up, um, it wasn't given a lot of currency. I also think that most of our shareholders, even though we have large institutions that invest in companies like the banks or Coles or Woolworths, um, there, are, there is a big turnover of shareholders and they're really only interested in their return over a shorter period of time. So they don't think about um, things. That, I, I talk to chief executives who say, I never get asked a question about how I run my company or, or, or what's my top team look like or what am I doing really on the environment. You get questions at the fringes, but most of the people, at, the big investors in our companies don't ask those questions. Now we all invest in those companies because, well not all of us as much, Margaret has pointed out, but we have superannuation. We actually have a voice. And um, maybe that's a question and, for the, and the panel. And that is when I talk to women, I say to them, you have got to exercise financial power. It's absolutely crucial for women to be taken seriously, that they need to be taken seriously as, as, as holding financial power. And you only need to have $100 worth of shares or $50 worth of shares, and you can go along to an AGM and you have the same right as somebody who's got $100 million worth of shares to stand up and say, why is your company boardroom uh, exclusive of, of, of women? Why do you not have any women in your senior management team? And I encourage women to do that all the time. Margaret? I think that's a great point. I'm also conscious that we have so little time to talk about gender equality. And I, I wanted to raise... Move on. Good. No, I, mm. I don't want to lose that point. I think it's so important. Very, yeah. That's all right. I keep harping on it. Good. Right. Okay. <laughs> Get your email, your superannuation. There, there is a, a global way. gender mm. gap report that's put out every four years. And Australia has came in 23rd last time. It was released last year. Previously, we were 15th. Now, we're losing ground in the gender equality stakes, and we're losing quite rapidly. Well, what and are they measuring in gender equality? Well, they're measuring a mean? whole, let me tell you, actually, a whole heap of things, including 
economic participation, education attainment, political empowerment and health. And we're actually falling quite much. The only one where we're Asian attainment. Educational attainment we're first with a number of countries. The rest we're way behind. New Zealand is way ahead of us in terms of gender equality. And I think we've got a real problem in our country, and now I'm gonna get a little bit controversial and say we have a very masculine culture. We have, in fact, a very buffhead culture that suppresses um, the sorts of interests that might advance women. Now, just for example, um, you know, I came to Melbourne two and a half years ago and I have to say that I still can't come to terms with the fact that my television, my space, my whole city is dominated by football. And I find that um, it's an insidious encroachment on my rights as a woman, as a citizen of this city, to see that all the resources, all of the, the airplay, all of the um, interest. One of the first questions I was asked is, who's your team? And I said, I beg your pardon? <laughs> who's your team? So I think there's a lot of things that we need to focus in on that will shape, that shape gender inequality. Um, the encroachment on resources is one of them, the encroachment on space and the encroachment on media time. I think I'd like to raise that as a really significant issue and put it in the context of this gender equality gap. But well, I thought know, can we I were interesting issue on that. Yes, can, can I raise absolutely. an interesting issue on that? Because, um, and I think Helen touched on it before, um, it's, it's an issue of the gender lens because that also, interestingly enough, when you talk about an unequal distribution of resources, it also exists, of course, in the world of philanthropy because you know that um, for every dollar, philanthropic dollar spent, only 20 cents goes to women and girls. And so when you're giving to um, a mainstream organisation like the Smith family or Mission Australia or your Salvation Army, um, and in, it's in an, in an ungendered way, you will very often find that the majority of those resources actually are applied to men rather than women and girls. And I had a very interesting example of that. I was at a dinner. Um, I won't mention the name of the dinner with a, a major trustee company who would supported a homeless project and uh, the CEO of the company stood up and said, you know, we're really pleased we've supported the building of 150 units for homeless people. And I was sitting next to the chair and I said, and how many of those homeless are women? And she said, not one. They'd built 150 units for men. Now, 46% of the homeless are women and 75% of the funding for homeless goes to men. And, we and, don't, and, we and I think it's a, it. that's, that, a, that's, that's such yeah. a good point because mm. where we do dominate is in poverty figures and we're increasingly um, dominating homeless figures. Mm. So I think those issues shouldn't be lost sight of. Well, and, and in fact, you touched on violence and um, the... the the undercurrent. I mean, here we are talking about the boardrooms and so forth, but we still we haven't resolved these fundamental issues in society. So, how do we? All right, let's um, let's start to think. How, if you could imagine it a different way, what would that look like? How would we start to get there? Um, if you threw that to me, I'd say we need more women's space, we need more women's services, we need to have safe spaces for women. And uh, we have refuges that are underfunded. It's, a, it's, a, it's an outdated model. We don't have places where young women can necessarily go to be safe. Um, they're not you know, um, conducive to the refuge culture. So we don't have safe spaces for women. We don't have places where we can protect and, and ensure that women um, have some somewhere to go when they're in trouble. And I would suggest you need more women in leadership roles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How because do we get you need that? more women yeah. making making decisions which actually impact on other women. So you've got a trickle down effect. Mm -hmm. Helen. Um, well, I, I, the other bit of all of that, I guess, is the world of work. And I, I think that there's um, a fundamental um, rethink about how work is constructed, which Will, which will benefit men and women. But when you think about the level of technology that exists and um, how that should, be, that should be liberating in all sorts of ways in terms of working from home, of, of you know, um, communicating in all sorts of different ways, um, and that 
reconstruction, if you like, or that renovation of how we think about work, and it's very challenging. I mean, I'm a, I, I run an organisation and I have to deal with requests for flexible working arrangements and you know this, that and the other. Um, at, but we've really got to do that and we've got to put a gender lens on that to say, and I think there's an, there's an incredible imperative, mm -hmm. like it's a train that's coming down the line in terms of labour market shortages, let alone skill shortages. The quote that you read at the start was from the 1940s and was probably um, uh, post just after Second World War. And that was a period, if you remember, where during the war years there was a drive to get women into the, to the work uh, place because the men were off at war and then after the war what they had to do was try to extract the women mm -hmm. out of the workplace so the men could have jobs so that was a really interesting time mm -hmm. and I think that unfortunately uh, I would like to think that a rights based argument works in, along the lines that we've talked about but there's nothing like an economic imperative to actually bring about the sort of change and I think it is a matter of combining all of this you know women have to seize the moment mm -hmm. and uh, we need the men who understand to do that as well to say what can we do to change change the way we do, uh, we construct our lives and that your comments about childcare and schooling hours and accessibility of um, getting to work and how we design work, that's all part of it, I think. Mm. I, I, I'm struck that we, we have a kind of 21st century way of, you know, social media and you can, they can find you on your Blackberry or your iPhone when you're out in the, I don't know, Bruny Island in Tasmania or somewhere, um, or further places further afield, but um, you still have to come into the office to do certain things. And there's an expectation about that, around that. And I, that just does my head in sometimes. I just, I just think, <laughs> okay, who just puts up the flag and says, stop on this? Um, but but can, so now we come to, okay, so that, how we start to shift that? What, what do we need to do and what's the urgency here? Um, but in order to get to there, um, I wanted to read to you, this is the, a statement by the chairman of a la, um, one of the world's biggest mining companies who just took over the, um, the role recently. And he declared that women in the boardroom, uh, well, why not? They're always welcome. But why make a case of it? Um, tell anyone you've got to have X number of women in the boardroom. W women are quite as intelligent as men. They have a tendency not to be so involved often. And they're not as ambition, uh, ambitious in business as men. Hasn't that guy been forced to resign now? <laughs> <laughs> I, I know there was a lot of um, the pressure. The chairman, Correct, isn't it? Simon yes, Murray. Yes, um, yes, yes. He, and, and I want to come back to this, but he did say that um, all these things have unintended con consequences. Pregnant ladies have nine months off. Do you think that means when I rush out, I'm absolutely desperate to have a young woman who's about to get married to come and work in my company? Now, they're going to go and get pregnant and go off in, for nine months. Now, <laughs> how, like, that's avert, okay? This, that's probably what you call an avert signal. Would that be right? I think um, so. <laughs> but, but I wonder how many people really think that, men and women. The lots. Are, so lots. how do we crack that? If that <laughs> is the story of... Uh, so he, he, he was pushed out after making... No, 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 I was being facetious. <laughs> oh. I was hoping... Because actually was a, it was really interesting because I, I was away that weekend with Alan and... Uh, and I read that article, it was on one of the newsletters that I get sent. And I said to him, oh my God, read this. And I gave it to Alan and, and I sent it around. I think I sent it to you and I sent it to my daughters and I sent it to everyone. And I said, look at this dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Well, within about 12 hours, there was such a backlash internationally. Um, we had posted it on Facebook. I'd put it on um, an American <laughs> women's site that I'm involved with. It had gone through Canada, through the United States, through the United Kingdom, and the press had picked it all up, and there was a huge backlash against what he said. And, in fact, in one of the articles, and I haven't followed it up since, actually said that he may be forced to resign before he even starts because yeah. it was the float of a $60 billion resource company, and he's a Hong Kong-based old fart who was asked to be the chairman. <laughs> um, he, he also um, he was taken to task by shareholders, I'm, I might add, and maybe that's something different this time. Um, but I did want, I, I wanted to pick up on this issue of quotas because he's against them. Pretty much every um, senior director I, I come across 
um, opposes them. I've got a quote here from Jane Harvey of Medibank and um, another board. Um, she said, female directors, um, this kind of gets partly to the quota issue, but also to women wanting to get into these positions. She said, I get approached all the time by young women who want board positions, and some of them haven't actually achieved and made a name for themselves in their first career, and they want directorships um, to fit in with their children and that sort of thing. So I wonder um, about... Uh, but that's Simon right, but Murray that's on one hand saying they're not ambitious, yeah. and here on the other hand we're saying that... Yeah. Um, that, that, uh, and and they that's, need that's just like young men in the workforce putting themselves forward for roles that they're not ready for. I mean, they're okay. exploring. I mm. think that's fine. I have mm. no problem with that. Mm. But at the same time, I don't think that you should be appointing the wrong person mm -hmm. to the wrong job. I mean, you're just setting them up for failure. And why would you do that? Which is why I don't understand why anybody would believe that when you have a quota system in place, you would appoint anybody but the absolute best person for that role. So let's start, let's um, back up here a little bit. When we talk about quotas, um, quotas, the, the, it's, are we talking about the difference between legislating and mandating a certain percentage of roles to be set aside uh, versus what, voluntary targets or something? Because some companies and organisations already have voluntary targets. So what's and the difference? we had voluntary targets in place for about 30 years. Do you know, I think, I think the most um, salutary um, recent example um, ha has really been when the Business Council of Australia and the Australian Institute of Company Directors did look at those results about women represented in the top ASX companies and saying what on earth has gone wrong. And this is, I get back to the point about, you know, you have to make a decision that there are business benefits to have women in the boardroom. And in doing that, I think um, there were some, uh, my figures are going to be a little bit out, but in the preceding year before these two peak business organisations um, made his decision there were something like eight women appointed mm -hmm. to fill vacancies uh, for board appointments. When they actually got up to talk about their mentoring programs to saying we need to do something about this, there's a pool of talent there that remains untapped, it's not reflected in our boardroom activities. Within nine months I think the number of women appointed to boards had increased fourfold. And it's not that there was suddenly this pipeline rush of women available, it's because it was recognised that there is a gap in terms of the, the expertise that's being tapped into. But I strongly support what Carol just said. People are really scared about quotas and then you, you have to say to them, well, it, what else is going to work? Well, can I just say, I don't think they're necessarily scared of them in the sense that you're um, suggesting. I think, who's going to give up power willingly? Mm -hmm. Unless you have quotas, it's not going to be... I mean, people aren't altruistic enough to give up their position on a board just so that we can even up the terms. So quotas is the only way that we're going to get um, women into the boardroom in significant numbers. The other point I might make is you mentioned 30%. 30% is actually the point at which it becomes high, there, there's high, a high degree of resistance because after 30% women start to be almost normalised as board members but at 30% there's this, this point at which you can still control the agenda and um, I think you'll find 30% is a, resist, a, a number where you'll get to um, quite readily okay. but over that it becomes really interesting. Okay. Uh, um, so we move from the glass ceiling to the tipping point. We do. <laughs> yes, the aspiration. Yes. And somewhere along the line, there's the glass cliff I hear as yes. well, with <laughs> people being appointed to positions when they're not given support. And mm. It's actually yeah. it's interesting yeah. because I absolutely support what Margaret's saying and Helen. I mean, the thing is we need a complete paradigm shift. And I was talking to Alan about this in the con context of the innovator's dilemma, you know, where you have an entrenched system and, in, and, and um, a lot of sunk costs and um, stakeholders that are set up in a particular way of doing things. And you've just, just got to have a real shock to change the paradigm. 
And the way we're going to do that is with quotas, because this, this is just the new reality. You've just got to create the new reality. And if the new reality is quotas, mm -hmm. then you're going to have change. Because if you don't, the voluntary targets, look, at, it's just not going to work. I mean, it's a complete joke. When I was said before we've had voluntary targets for the last 30 years, we have. We've had Office of Status of Women. We've had, you know, Anne Summers, Wendy McCarthy, all tell me about the initiatives that they've, they've taken over the last three decades. And where have they got to? Absolutely nothing. So, so now the stock exchange, um, the, there's a body that oversees the governance of the, the listed equity, the share market, if you like. And they've, they've said that as of this year, starting reporting in January, mm -hmm. companies have to actually report on, um, monitor and measure the levels of um, promotion of women in their organisations. So surely if that is now part of the operating um, requirement, that would have a difference if... Well, uh, only, if, only if the shareholders yeah. deem it to be important and significant. And we just said before that we don't have any shareholder activism in women um, questioning, or in shareholders, by shareholders questioning why there aren't more women in senior roles. Now, you know, what's going to change that? The fact that they're going to write a nice little paragraph about, you know, the involvement of women in senior, at senior levels? I don't think so. I think we need leadership, but we also need our media commentators to start taking this seriously and to report on these issues in a fair and um, a way that represents women um, equally. I don't think that's done at present. Well, I'm going to use that as an opportunity to come back to something that you raised initially about the Boofhead nation. Mm -hmm. And that was the... Um, did that go out on the internet? Yes, it did. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and that was... Um, it was brought up during Julian Assange's court hearing, um, and one, one, one his lawyer and the Swedish MPs had made had referred to. So let me just um, discover this because I think it's quite an important um, point. So, on this issue of um, chauvinism. Um, in reporting on um, Julian Assange's um, case, the Guardian newspaper said, men like Assange who refer to women as, quote, hotties, hail from the land of coarse jokes about one-eyed trouser snakes. And the Icelandic MP Brigitte Johnstor agreed, saying it was important to bear in mind the culture Assange has come from. He's a classic Aussie in the sense that he's a bit of a male chauvinist. So the, 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 the environment that we're working in um, is resistant to quotas. I hear from uh, men and women, actually, that they, they want to be appointed on merit, that a quota won't allow them to be appointed on merit. Why, that? why do you think that is? Why, why, are, why are merit and quotas mutually exclusive? Yeah. Very good point. What does merit, merit mean? Merit is a very what do we slippery concept yeah. and it's very much based on homo sociability, which means that we appoint what we know. Yeah. Um, and merit slips around depending on um, who you want to appoint. Mm. So there it's is part no, of the lens that, that we can't see that we're actually bringing to our I mean, you can have the same world, educational yeah. Yeah. Um, achievements, etc., mm -hmm. etc., et but um, when you start using the concept merit, you know that something's being hidden. Okay. <laughs> Helen, did you have a quick point? Oh, we're well, going to get no, a question. I was, I was going to agree with that. I yeah. mean, if you go back to thinking about the violinist performing behind the... Um, the curtain and uh, the gender not being obvious. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, it really, merit is often used as, a, as an excuse uh, rather than actually um, looking at the totality of, you know, what, what you're trying to achieve through your recruitment processes. Well, and, and I think it was Jane Currow, the social commentator, who said that um, we assume that the people already there have merit. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. exactly. Um, so, what we want as women is to have as many mediocre women appointed to boards as there are men. Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> that's right. Do you know, I was with a group of senior men yesterday, and I had that experience, which um, I don't. I, I'm now I see I see it more often, but I was in a group and I was the only woman and I stepped into a group of, of men and um, it still surprises me. Um, some other man came and joined the group and he went round and introduced himself and said hello to the others, and went right past me. Oh, really? <laughs> and, I, and I was staring. I was in a bright red coat and I was thinking <laughs> I should have stepped up the colour. <laughs> but it just made me kind of reflect on on our ability to actually see um, what authority, what leaders leaders look like, and what what our unconscious image of that is and it, it it just never it kind of set me back on my heels a bit because I thought oh gosh we're talking about all of this but we're not 
And on the other hand, I have a, a, a friend and colleague, a, a fabulous woman who's on a number of boards who um, was criticised because she goes into a room and she makes sure she introduces herself and shakes hands and as you would, and uh, she was criticised for being an overt networker. <laughs> yeah. well, I, that, that, I would probably put that in the category of the women are, are their own worst enemies. Yes. What, 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 what do you judge? think when you hear that? She I wasn't that called that by women. She was called no. that by men. By men. By men. She was criticised by men for being an overt networker. But I, I, that was feedback that I she was given. I thought women weren't very good at networking. So well, is this You see, double... when we are, we're overt and aggressive. Okay. <laughs> so there's something Language around... again. One rule for... What was this? Mm. Language again. Language. Yeah. And, and seeing a, a, a principle of reversibility here, perhaps.